Ops and Development Conference. We hope you enjoyed a fruitful series of sessions yesterday, and of course, dinner at the National Museum. Today, we have a special plenary session. Keynote speaker, Mr. Mikhail Rutkowski, will discuss the World Bank's approach on the rethinking of job creation. Afterwards, Mr. Daniel Hammermesh will share with us his thoughts on laboring in development economics. Now, please welcome Mr. Piotr Lewandowski. All right, good morning, everyone. So I have a pleasure to, to chair this session. And uh, the first talk will be by Micho, but maybe let me first invite both speakers to, to the stage, if we have the stage. Uh, <laughs> perfect. So, so the first, as, as was said, the first talk was, will be by, by Michał Rutkowski. Michał is the Senior Director for Social Protection in Jobs, and Jobs, I'm sorry, over, uh, overseeing the World Bank global practice responsible for, uh, for protecting the poor and vulnerable from shocks uh, and poverty, improving their job opportunities, and uh, covered, by, covered by safety nets. Uh, Michał has a long history at the bank. Uh, for us, Pauls, he was one of the first people who actually made it in the 90s. So uh, uh, he, was, he was at the bank in the, in the 90s and the 2000s working on the transition economies in Central and Eastern Europe and, and Turkey overseeing work on multiple reforms. He was also uh, for two years out of the bank and quite instrumental in pension reforms in Poland in the late 90s. After he returned to the bank, he stayed in the same field, worked in, in, in Africa, in Asia. Then he was a country, then he was a senior economist, uh, and, no, uh, a manager, a sector manager in, uh, in, in Moscow. Uh, and after a couple of years in, in Russia, he moved back to DC and now is a is a senior director for social protection and jobs. From the point of view of this conference and the network of, of, for jobs and development, uh, it's really, for, for me it's really nice that Michał is giving a keynote talk here because Michał was our speaker at one of the very first events that network has organized in Warsaw back in 2014. So after four years we are in, in, we're in a kind of more international, much larger, event and probably with a broader topic because back then we were talking just social protection, pensions and, and population aging. So with much, without much further ado, Michal, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Piotr, for a nice introduction. It's really a pleasure to uh, have a chance to uh, talk to you again. Um, uh, one of the uh, one of the surprises for you is that uh, even though I, I will speak for a fair amount of time, there will be only five slides, which is very rare those days. Usually I notice I'm in presentations where there are more, uh, more slides than minutes of the presentation. <laughs> and uh, with some ambitious colleagues, I was telling you, it cannot be, you need, to have, you need to have at least no more than one slide per two minutes, but I think I, I deliver on that today. Um, what I'm going to talk about uh, is indeed uh, what is on the, on the slide, the new thinking about jobs, the World Bank approach. Uh, let, me, uh, let me, however, make a few qualifiers. So it, it, is, it is supposed to sound like a very sexy title, as if there was a new paradigm out there in the World Bank and everything is changing. It is not the case at all. These are small changes that take place at stages in the approach uh, to jobs. Uh, changes that in our approach to jobs, we learn a lot from what we work with our partners, clients, researchers, and, uh, and it's not like there is a suddenly a quantum leap and everything is new, but there are certain more important moments uh, than, uh, than others, and they often move the paradigm, and even the, when the paradigm is moved, um, it doesn't mean everybody complies. There is always a struggle, a debate. We are actually a very, we, among many 
incarnations of the World Bank, one of the, our, our true, true, true identities is that we are a debating society as much as we are a development institution and as much as we are a bank. So uh, keep that in mind uh, as, a, as a qualifier that what I'm going to tell you is not the view of the bank and then you meet every employee and he or she will tell you that. It is a, it is a constant uh, struggle, sort of, you know, two steps ahead, one step back of, of this kind. But I think it probably would be, would be fair to say, to start by saying that for years there has been, uh, in terms of rules in use, if not espoused rules, a certain paradigm of thinking about uh, jobs uh, in the World Bank. And this paradigm was very much rooted in the view, uh, again caricaturing slightly, that if you get everything right on a macro scene, um, and if you don't mess up with other things such as uh, labor market policies or sector policies or picking winners, then everything ends up well, including a sufficient number of jobs. So the, for years, uh, I would risk saying that with, with various shifts in emphasis, the paradigm by driving the jobs agenda within the World Bank Group uh, was very much focused on increasing investments, improving allocative efficiency, and promoting business climate and therefore uh, growth. Uh, and in general, there is not much to criticize there because when economies grow, they do create jobs. And uh, when are, there are no distortions in the allocation of resources, labor and capital, uh, those jobs are created in sectors and economic activities where they generate the most value. So over time, jobs move from lower to higher productivity sectors, from rural to urban areas, and from informal to formal activities. So we will observe those structural trans transformations which contribute to actually lifting people out of, uh, out of poverty. Uh, in, this, in this particular paradigm, which is very much focu or focused on getting macroeconomic policies right so that the growth is there, um, in this particular uh, paradigm, there are obviously many other things which need to be looked at such as the rule of law, such as fighting cronyism and corruption, um, and uh, there is even some space for thinking of human capital as being instrumental in uh, approaching, in increasing growth, having workers with uh, right skills. Uh, however, at the same time, if you think about it in this paradigm, a sort of which I would call a growth-oriented approach, where the focus is on increasing investments, improving allocative efficiency and promoting growth. In fact, the only set of policies that is uh, left to deal directly with jobs um, are those needed to improve the functioning of the labor market and protect workers. So in this paradigm, you get macro right, and then you want to make sure that labor regulations are reasonable, uh, that, uh, that the labor market is neither overly rigid nor overly open to the point to which workers are unprotected. And if in this paradigm you use active and or passive labor market policies, that's fine, but there is a deep skepticism because a lot of impact evaluations, most of impact evaluations showed that especially active labor market, market policies work well only under certain quite uh, rigid circumstances. And they can be done, if done well, they work, but it seldom happens, and it's very hard to figure out ex ante for which group of workers they would be actually working well. So it could be that in one country it's for men over 40. If they, if they go over skills training delivered by private sector institutions in another country, it could be that it only work for uh, young women, and it's only if wage subsidies are used, not skills training. And there was a period of lots of lots of evaluation. I think the debate is still out there. Uh, is that possible to make active labor market policies uh, more uh, productive, more efficient? Uh, the graph uh, which you have uh, there basically illustrates the, what I, I call here a bit, uh, maybe theatrically, the previous paradigm, or, or it's the, the thinking that was there. And the main problem with this thinking is that it didn't deliver on jobs as expected, meaning there is a huge dispersion, as you see, um, uh, as you see the red line and dispersion around it. So there are so many countries that are disappointed in job outcomes, even if they have a sound growth, something which 
which is clearly a cause of concern, and obviously asks a question whether something needs to be shifted in this paradigm, added, subtracted, changed. That, that, that graph is for low-income countries and lower-middle-income countries only, which is the bulk of, uh, of our partners. Uh, so, in that context, the question is what, what could be done, how to rethink this paradigm. And uh, some of you who follow those, uh, the, no, the, the, the global products, one we are very proud of in the World Bank Group is the World Development Report, which we produce annually and is our flagship publication. It was, in fact, the most important for us. And there was a jobs uh, world development report in 2013 that started advancing some other thinking about the links between investments and jobs, which is a very complex link and, and requir it requires certain particular look. And this is where, where a new paradigm started emerging, or at least started being put forward. And this new paradigm does not have new notions. Uh, it is strongly based on the notion of externalities. It's a very uh, old notion. But it's trying to be much more specific about what externalities we are talking about, and uh, also what are the policy implications of those externalities. So in uh, that context, uh, the main sort of uh, the main constatation at the beginning of the thinking about it was that uh, policies that uh, increase investments and maximize rate of return to capital uh, do not necessarily generate the quantity or distribution of jobs needed to address today's problems. And uh, the reason why it happens is because jobs have externalities that are not incorporated in decision-making process when investment and growth decisions are taken. Um, and uh, those externalities, uh, speaking very broadly, here on the screen um, I divided into uh, social externalities on the right-hand side and labor externalities on the, on the left-hand side. Uh, I think the notion of social externalities is obvious. I will say a few words about it uh, a bit later, a few minutes later. But I'd like to focus for a second on, uh, on, on labor externalities, which are, which, are, which are very important. And they are really based on the notion that jobs are central to economic growth, and they are not only a byproduct or a consequence. Uh, it's not just you cannot just think about demand for labor as a derived demand. Using the term of demand for labor in the presence of Professor Hammermesh is somewhat, uh, you know, make me nervous. <laughs> but given his phenomenal contribution to that area. But the point is, for a long time, I even remember, I, I, I mentioned World Development Report. I was a uh, young staff in the bank, was a team member of the workers in an integrating world, 1995. And uh, with that perspective, I would say we very clearly said if macro is right, if business climate is right, is corruption, and yeah, we even at that time did not talk about corruption, then labor demand is a derived demand. If you don't mess up with it through sector policies or labor policies, everything will be fine. But the notion of externalities, especially the, the, the social and, and labor comes in. And this is the notion that, uh, that economies also can grow because of jobs not the jobs are a result of those. Because more people work, because each job becomes more productive, because workers move from low to high productivity jobs, because households escape poverty when they get better jobs, and jobs also accumulate to human capital and to social stability. People learn and become more productive while they work. Let's put aside social stability. All those previous notions are essentially labor externalities. And uh, in the environment when there is high unemployment or underemployment, uh, when firms consider a new investment, they calculate the internal rate of return based on the market wages they expect to pay. But when there is a massive unemployment or underemployment, what may happen is that the opportunity cost of labor is in fact well below market wages. And that difference can be considered a labor externality. That is, the firm doesn't take into account the benefits of not having labor resources idle, uh, and uh, including the benefits of workers whose incomes would rise due to investment. 
And this is very, very important issue for so many, especially low and middle income countries with very high underemployment or very high unemployment. And many of them characterized with structural unemployment and unemployment focused among youth. That's the notion of labor externalities. The notion of social externalities uh, is the one which we have been using for years and we understood them and it was never sort of, it was always nihil novi sub solem. Uh, however, it's never been in earnest incorporated, I think, in thinking about, about jobs policies. But these are a few things worth, uh, worth uh, listing here. If society has preferences for reducing poverty or inequality, sustainable jobs for poor people has, uh, has an obvious social externality. Jobs can reduce risk of criminality and radicalization of youth, especially in fragile settings. Um, uh, and therefore, having jobs is a clear contribution to very hard to measure social cohesion and social stability. Specifically, jobs for young women can also produce externalities by facilitating human capital accumulation um, in their children, partly because uh, of reduced uh, fertility, which leads to, uh, leads to health and nutrition gains. And this is an enormously important factor if uh, you believe in the benefits of early childhood development and in the fact that uh, the, uh, the stunting or malnutrition has a long-lasting impact on human capital of those stunted or malnourished and that's therefore impact on growth, therefore impact of jobs you have an, in, a, in a vicious circle. And uh, the jobs for women may create a virtuous long-term circle of uh, contributing to future growth and future uh, jobs. But the bottom line of that all is that these externalities uh, create a gap between social and private rates of return on investments and uh, become a central justification for, for jobs policies, for having a special focus on jobs. Uh, because even if policy maker, uh, makers succeed in tackling other factors that undermine firms' private investment returns, the private sector still might not invest enough or it might not generate the optimal portfolio of investments from the point of view of jobs outcomes. Um, uh, it might well be that, that there are certain types of investment when there is too much capital going into those investments that are, may bring growth, but they are less efficient for society from the jobs perspective. I come back in a few minutes to the issue of policies and what could be done and what this new paradigm entails. Before that, let me just give you a very, very big picture of the situation today in the world in terms of the, in terms of the labor force. Um, and it will be really a tour d'horizon. Um, we, see, we are facing a problem, but let's, let's start with the, there are some basic, basic, basic numbers. One I would particularly highlight is, uh, is, is the share of self-employed. You see it is, it is two-thirds worldwide, so uh, very often, very often the, there are so much work going on, including research work on, on those remaining 35%. So, however, where, where the rubber hits the road for development is indeed on the, on the right-hand side. But a few other numbers is, are important. There are 200 million people currently unemployed, of which 75 uh, million are uh, youth. And this is a tip of the iceberg because we have 1.2 billion people of working age who are not even participating in the labor market, and most of those are women. Uh, we have various, various estimates how many jobs need to be created by 2030. We use 2030 as our end point because of the sustainable development goals, you would recall there is this agreement, sustainable development goals are expected to, or have united the, the development community along the set of objectives. And for 2030, the most recent estimates is of 530 million jobs. And then among those 3.5 billion who do not have a job, two thirds are in those very low productivity informal jobs on the right hand side of the right hand uh, part of the slide here, those self-employed. Uh, farmers own account workers in small household enterprises in very low productivity activity, uh, activities often without pay. And among those, among those there, 66% are poor um, according to various classifications. This, this one used of poverty is, is income specific. It used, it, this is absolute poverty but adjusted to the income one. It is $1.9 for the countries that are, that are the poorest countries. And then again, looking, looking at that picture, what we need to think about, so it looks quite, 
quite dangerous now in terms of not having enough jobs, but now we are, enter we are enter uh, entering the territory of, of megatrends coming, which in addition to everything will we see, and what we see is insufficient growth creation, insufficient, uh, insufficient uh, uh, transformation. There is no enough firms in which enter the, the market, and those that enter do not grow. Uh, so it's already bad, and then we have the trends coming. And it would be a very, very, very long discussion if we talked about all the trends. But I, I just select three to mention demographics, technological, and migration. But we also, there are many others, economic, social, climate change, which I, I'm not going to, to mention. Um, those three are worth mentioning. And again, here is no surprises. Maybe what I like to highlight in demographic trends are those two very, very opposing trends, where in young countries, typically poor, there is the rapid increase of the number of youth entering the labor market, uh, which leads to this number of 520 million jobs that will need to be created between now and 2030. And then we have aging at most of Europe and East Asia, and the challenge then there is keep it, to keep the elderly working, working for longer and increase labor force participation. And that immediately brings me, brings me to migration. Yesterday in discussions, uh, I did mention migration as a, be, being a huge, huge development, uh, having pu huge positive development outcomes and needed to be seen consistently that way. Uh, the numbers of migrants, depending on how recent migrants you count, would be, if you look, look at last, say, five years, would be 250 million. If you look at the whole stock, almost one billion in terms of one in seven persons in the world is a migrant. Um, I think the issue here is there is no solution to jobs problem without migration. Migration has to happen. And migration, if done not in the acceptable social pace for sending and receiving countries, creates social tensions and create negative externalities that can actually uh, make the world not delivering of, on the needed project. So it needs to be carefully managed. And this is an issue which I found uh, somewhat under-researched, the, how, the, how the management of migration, both with sending countries, with receiving countries, um, what, what are the effects of that, how effective it is, what are the costs, uh, what are the successful uh, pathways. Uh, because, as I, let me repeat, there is no solution to the jobs challenges without migration. And further confusion of migration with forced displacement even further bless the picture. Finally, technological change, and I only selected a subset of, of trends. And here, uh, uh, obviously, the stylized facts for the future, the, the, the big picture is as follows. New technology increases productivity. It's a big opportunity for workers. There is no question about that. And in the past, all cycles of technology coming to the picture did exactly that. And those who expected this, that jobs will be destroyed were consistently wrong. Um, uh, our sense is uh, this is the same here. Those who expect this uh, are, will, will pro be proven wrong. But there are huge risks on the way because at the same time when productivity goes up, risks go, go up at the same time big way for workers, which opens up the whole new area which we work very, very hard in our global practice in the bank, new social protection systems, new way of dealing with that, which I totally leave out of that, of that particular, um, of that particular uh, presentation to you. But what I would like to highlight is that those technologies uh, bring challenges to job creation, because new technologies also destroy jobs by replacing workers that it cannot be denied. Uh, and then uh, we may underestimate the time and effort which it takes to reconnect workers to jobs. Um, new technologies may also reduce uh, the comparative advantage of low-income countries, uh, which we took for granted somewhat in terms of cheap labor, because of reassuring the firms tend to b bring back jobs because it is not any more uh, useful, any more economic to uh, ship them out to developing countries. And finally, the new technologies change the role of the firm even faster than anything in the past. Um, so old paradigm of firms, firms clustered in one place, um, uh, integration ge in geographical space, uh, the, the, um, uh, the uh, Marshallian view of the world is coming out very quickly of, uh, of, of, of relevance. 
What does that entails in this, in those, in those uh, contexts, in the context of technology change? First is connection. It is very important that the, the workers stay connected. Because there is a huge power of being connected and therefore being able to do jobs from various locations. And there are huge, connect, uh, 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 huge implications of this for skills and social protection, which I will not dwell into. So, in that context, what could be done? This would be my last part, uh, which is that uh, let me first offer the way of thinking about it, which we accepted in the bank. This is the way we try to look at it. There are three aspects of jobs, and they are, they are embedded in job strategies, which we try to prepare for those countries that are interested. This is in the interest of time. I will not dwell on it, but this is about access. It's about the quality, and it's about the quantity. You have access, quantity, quality triangle here. And this is fairly for, for, for you self-explanatory, so I don't need to dwell into that. So let me, without going into details, fast forward to what it means for policies. And let me make a proposal that we need really an integrated set of policies that places people and jobs at the center stage to reach the overarching goal of fostering inclusive growth and a global economy that works for everyone. And that has three types of policies, of which first and second are Obvious have always been tried. First is macro and regulatory policies. These are fundamental, straight policy, labor regulations, labor taxation. Second are labor policies, including active labor market policies. A lot to be said about skills and skill mismatches. But an important part is a third part, which are sectoral and regional policies, demand-side approach to the labor market, correcting, uh, correcting the market outcome because of social and labor externalities I talked about. So uh, in that context, there is a whole set of uh, proposals, the whole set of policies which we talk about that starts with something I just mentioned, leave no one offline, but then it goes into many other interventions ranging from working on value chains in agriculture so that people and uh, household, uh, household enterprises are brought to the market. Um, so. Uh, it is working uh, towards uh, the situations in which m rural communities who first are online, but even if they are online and it still doesn't help and farming jobs are disappearing, they need to link to value chains. But it may well be that it's not possible, they need to migrate. I, I, our research show shows that they don't migrate to big cities. You need secondary cities on the labor side to be actively supported to allow for migration that is small in the first step, may turn on to be a bigger in the second uh, step. So um, basically in this sense, uh, there are the, the, we, what we are trying to do helping our countries is to do so-called job diagnostics, which at the macro level looks at whether patterns of job creation and labor productivity are enabling the type of transformations that is needed. And then the firm level at the household level looks at the dynamics of firms as well as, uh, as the uh, determinants of labor outcomes at the household level. Let me, let me finish by saying what is the most important in, in, in our view uh, when it comes to, uh, to understand the solutions. And in all these three areas, the work on macro and regulatory framework, on labor, labor regulations and labor policies, and also on sectoral policies on the demand side, how they influence jobs, this is a huge agenda for the future, which I think more research should be done. Especially that any sector policy has been labeled as picking winners. So there is a very hostile territory for anybody who tries to think about value chains and try to think what particular interventions on the demand side of the labor market would actually deliver on jobs as opposed to first delivering on growth and then on jobs. So this is a risky territory for, for anybody, but extremely important that maybe where the rubber hits the road. And then the, 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 these are general ideas, but we really need more research and policy analysis, and we need to determine what is the best way to design and implement those policies and programs. Um, I think another area and final one which I'd like to mention is uh, an improvement in research in quantitative methods for measurement and evaluation in the sense that we need to be able to assess ex ante and expose the impact of different policies. And for that stand the, standard, the standard way we approached it, we all think very highly of those are RCTs. Um, RCTs are very important, but so often I see that governments cannot wait until programs are implemented. Second, we cannot randomize everything. 
Uh, and we need to benefit from using some other methods, big data, large scale administrative data, machine learning. So the question is, uh, it may well be that, that RCTs will play a less important role because of the need for fa faster turnover uh, conclusions. In closing, let me say that um, it is not that the old paradigm goes out, new paradigm comes in. It is just that uh, by step by step by uh, raising awareness and raising tools, uh, increasing the number of tools that could help in looking at the, uh, at the economy through the jobs lenses can bring improvement in um, what has been lagging, which is the jobs outcomes much more lagging than growth outcomes. And this needs to be done in a, also because the new megatrends may actually make a situation even more challenging and never, even more, more um, dire, uh, for, especially for those in low-income countries, especially for those in self-employed and in household enterprises. So we need you to focus on research and solutions. And I am very, very happy to see you actually doing it here in Bogota those days. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Michal. I think that the, the, the final conclusion, which was not necessarily the final the policy conclusion, but the, uh, but the conclusion that all of us are really happy to hear, because that means that we will have something to do for the next couple of years. And also, I've, I've, I think that the point you made earlier, that there is maybe a shift in the paradigm in how policy is being conducted. There is increasing attention paid to the factors that actually make firms make jobs and make people take these jobs. And this is important change from the, from the, from the paradigm that was back in the days. And I think that for, for, for us, um, as we remember how the transition in Poland panned out, that was, that was kind of, uh, it's a very strong change in the paradigm because for years we actually all believed that if the economy will be growing, the jobs will be there. And then it emerged that actually it could be the labor uh, market related issues that make people unhappy and actually also, even though the, the economy is growing and the incomes are growing, and they actually create a political, they have a political or social ramifications, even though if you look just at the macro statistic, everything looks looks fine, but there is some, some deeper uh, heterogeneity in the experience behind. So we have a couple of minutes for questions. So, uh, so we can definitely take a couple of them and then maybe let me how to answer sure. to, to two or three. Maybe it's gonna be uh, better that way than one after another. So, uh, Radhika, do we have a mic on the, do we have a mic on the floor? We can take one of these, yeah. but, uh, but we're streaming that, so the mic is needed for, for, for streaming, apparently. For streaming. Can... Thank you. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. So I'm from India, and one of the big challenges that we're facing at the moment, because we have a very large working age population, is the challenge of job creation. Now, India has seen reasonably high economic growth, but we haven't seen that high economic growth translate into employment growth. So the first slide that you put there is actually very pertinent to us in India. That is really growth translating into job creation, and is high growth, in fact, enough to create jobs? So what I wanted to ask you about this was that in a lot of developing countries, we see a very large unorganized sector. Our focus on growth is typically on just the organized sector. And that's perhaps why we have not seen the high growth in the organized sector translate into job creation. A large part of the workforce is trapped in low wage, low productivity jobs in the unorganized sector. We're not seeing enough growth happen there, and that's why we don't see employment creation. So to what extent do you think that the existence of this dualistic structure in the labor market actually results in a disconnect between growth and job creation? You want me to take them one by one or to collect a few? Do we have any other questions straight away? If not, let's do okay. it one by one. Of course. Uh, I think what you, what you described is absolutely, 
absolutely true. That has been the case. I have an impression, though, that there is uh, there are slow ingredients of certain revolution happening, including or maybe in particular in India. And what I what I I mean a few things by this. But the first thing which I mean is that I think what is happening is uh, our way of thinking about the uh, unorganized sector is shifting in the following way. Uh, for many, many years, this dualism was not only a reality, it was a, re a reality. India has been an economy, India was an economy which we call 90-10 economy, 90% 90 uh, unorganized, 10% organized 40 years ago, and it is 90-10 now. It is not even 80-20, it's 90-10, it's amazing, right? At the same time, so much effort was paid by, including international actors and us, how to formalize, formalize, formalize. ILO was on the forefront of that. Nothing worked, really, in te these terms. So what we need to shift our attention is not to think anymore about formalization. This is actually a word that should be discarded. We should think about improving the conditions of work in the informal sector, the quality of jobs in the informal sector, and most importantly, about how to help those, which is a part of the quality of jobs, those workers, to have engagements that allow them to manage their life risks. And on that, I see India is a bit in the forefront of the revolution, through the direct income transfers, through pension system that started allowing for auto-enrollment. These are very beginnings. We are talking about a few percent, less than one percent, but there is a lot of thinking and attempts of trying to create a setting in which workers in an unorganized sector have that less and less unorganized as opposed to being employed by large employers, which is not going to happen. So I think where the, the, this, this shift is a shift that is a first step towards improving the situation. To, it, it, it also would go into, into things like transition from NREGA to sustainable jobs, better graduation policies. NREGA is a public work scheme in India, the, big, the biggest in the world. Um, and if you think about it, it goes hand in hand with the changes in uh, developed countries or in high income countries where we have more and more uh, workers slipping into what we would call less organized or unorganized sectors through contracting out part-time part work. So in a way, rather than having formal informal, I think we are going into the continuum and we need to create a new ways of recognizing the validity of low-income, part-time, household-based jobs and improve their quality and enable workers to manage their risks. I only can kind of mention the direction of travel. I know it's going to be a hard travel, but what I know well is that the old direction of travel will never work. Thanks. Yes, we have two more. Uh, yeah, the mic, Rajat Katuri, and then we have another right. one in the front. Thanks, Piotr. Thanks, Mikhail. Let me uh, just echo what Radhika said, that this was most interesting presentation. Thank you very much for that. My question follows from what uh, Radhika was saying and, and from the perspective of India and from the approach of, you know, what can we do in terms of policy? You outlined three sort of big uh, policies that one could uh, use for, for labor market interventions. Macro policy, of course, to is your active labor market policies and three targeting social externalities. Thinking about it from the point of view of any emerging market, including India, where I guess the macro policies are going to have a momentum of their own. I mean, it's hard to think that we'll actually address macro policies for the sake of labor market policies. Uh, they'll be addressed at their own speed, at their own time. So between, so keeping that, you know, active macroeconomic policies aside, between two and three active labor market policies targeting social inter uh, interventions in, uh, targeting social externalities in, in particular sectors. We've recently undertaken in India targeted policies for labor intensive sectors. Uh, and I think that might produce results in terms of, of job creation. Again, skill development programs, the number two policy that you uh, mm. mentioned, will perhaps happen, but they'll take time. So to my mind, and I want your reaction to this, I mean, if you go, if we go uh, the, the sort of upside down in terms of one, two, three, three, two, one, uh, in, in terms of targeting social externalities, in terms of active labor market policy, and then getting the macro right uh, on its own term. What do you think? I mean, is that an approach that would serve countries like India uh, well? 
Yeah, my immediate reaction is in, in 90, 10 countries uh, and in India, one would not expect macro policies to be motivated by jobs outcomes. However, what I would expect, and I think it is, it is where we need to go, uh, these are two things. Uh, fair, it's a combination of uh, programs that are focused on uh, poverty alleviation, uh, such as livelihood programs in India, um, uh, uh, having graduation components that are through asset transfers, through coaching, much more attuned to the need of those who may become sustainable entrepreneurs, and that's the one step. One, one pillar. And the second pillar are sectoral policies, which you, which you just mentioned. And in those sectoral policies, I would think of both the demand and supply side. Demand side is focusing on labor intensive uh, industries. And, um, uh, and, uh, but within then, much more detailed approach is needed in terms of what exactly on the demand side can be jobs oriented. And the general, it's not enough to generally determine that say textiles are labor intensive, the other sector is not therefore invest in textiles. It need to come at a much more, a much more granular level uh, in terms of looking at what makes those workers productive. And there is a third element which you also mentioned, which is the, the skills element in the, the national skills mission, which is now renamed. But I think there is a there is a bit of a, a shift needed. First is the consistent involvement of the of the private sector in the in the in the um, in skills policies. It has been missing, especially before the um, the skills, national skills corporation was created. But even now, it is not consistent. And the second is um, the issue of uh, combining uh, skills that would uh, lead those workers to be those skills geared to those labor intensive industries with lifetime soft skills that would allow them to be much more effective being on their own. Uh, what I have in mind in the last one, the competition, including in India, between say Uber drivers is not at all a competition on the driving skills or car, car fixing schemes. It's a competition on soft skills of greeting the passengers. And this is a very important thing to remember because there is a reality. I, you may disagree, that's even my experience. And, and that's why that needs to be reflected in the way skill acquisition is approached. All right, thank you. We have time for one more. Uh, my name is Philippe Berger. Um, so production function is labor and capital. So uh, to complement what you've said here on, on the capital side, uh, how would you think in terms of investment in labor uh, intensive versus capital intensive uh, 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 capital? Uh, and uh, also in terms of public sector infrastructure to, to complement uh, because we know whether it's the US or South Africa or whichever country you like, public sector investment has, has been pretty dismal over uh, and you sit with old infrastructure, etc. So how do you see those complementarities uh, uh, linking up with this? Thank you. This is a di very difficult but interesting question and um, uh, I think what I, uh, I, I would have two things in mind. Um, and the, the first is that um, the public policies to recognize uh, the importance of jobs should uh, seriously look at the validity of wage subsidies. I didn't use the term wage subsidies when I spoke, uh, but this is a sort of an un unnamed hero here, because in many places, the, the, uh, br it's bringing closer together social rate of return and um, per private rate of return does require precisely, preci precisely that. And uh, second round effects for having, having more Having, uh, having more jobs and having more human capital acquisition of jobs improves L, but also may improve total factor productivity. I haven't thought, we haven't thought much about the, 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 the K part of the production function, but a, a, a thing in it which uh, I would uh, come to my mind is to be more consistent in linking, looking at investment outcomes to jobs potential of those investments, big transport investments, big other infrastructure. So do not to end, uh, for instance, the transport investment just on the, what it brings in terms of transportation, but how much it may contribute further to bringing um, farmers to the value chains by having a, 
rural road of improved quality. I'm talking about improvement quality to go far beyond pub what public works can do, but which is a partial infrastructure investment or bridge for that matter. So that would be that would be thinking that too often investment decisions do not even try to incorporate jobs outcomes by default. If the default is that you, given the power of the defaults, if the default is you've got to incorporate them and then you may see that there are no there, that should be a part of the routine decision making process. And by the way, this is what in the bank we try to work with our infrastructure colleagues to do, to have job lenses to everything that is being done. I would not say that it is easy because we have a lot of muscle memories for years in which those jobs uh, outcomes were not taken on board. But your point is an excellent and one of the most difficult to realize. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I need to wrap it up here um, as we move to the, to the second keynote. So thank you, Michal. Let's have one more round of applause. <laughs> so so the, with the second keynote, we're moving, a I guess, I expect we'll move a little bit away from the policymaking world, a little bit closer to the academic academic work and academic research. Uh, our second keynote is Daniel Hammermesh, who is uh, one of the leading labor economists in the world. And he's a distinguished scholar at Barnard College, editor-in-chief of the ISA Award of Labor, and ISA Network Director these days. So you know, he's a professor emeritus at the Royal Holloway University of London and at the University of Texas, Austin. And he's also a fellow at the Econometric Society, research associate at the National Bureau of economic research and past president of the Society of Labor Economies and the Midwest Economics Association. So, I mean, all of us here are familiar with uh, with Dan's work, but uh, but I will I will list, will list his accomplishments anyway. So, uh, he published around 100 scholarly papers, and he made a he made the notable com contributions to a range of fields uh, to labor demand. And his seminal book on labor demand was published in 1991 by. Princeton University, 1993, I'm sorry, by Princeton University pre uh, Press. Uh, he also worked extensively on the analysis of time use, and I just learned uh, yesterday that he's probably having a book on that topic because it's called Spending Time, uh, so I guess it's on that topic. It, it will come out next year. Uh, he, he, he also work, worked extensively on discrimination on, on academic labor markets, and on the quite unusual application of labor economic methods to various topics like beauty, sleep, suicide, and he also have a, have a book on beauty, actually arguing that beauty pays. So, and his, his accomplishments have been reflected in the recognition of our profession, and in, 2011, in 2011, Dan received the ISA Prize in Labor Economics, and in 2014, the Mincer Award for Lifetime Contribution to Labor Economics of the Society of Labor Economics. And before I, on a personal note, uh, before I finished, uh, 10 years ago I wrote a paper which uh, turned out to be my first publication, actually, and I submitted that paper to ZEW, Summer School in Labor Economics, and I was accepted. And Dan was a keynote there, so, so that's where I first time met Dan for the first time, and actually it's worth, uh, even though there was not much sleeping at that summer school. Uh, in, in July, everyone was waking up in the morning, and Dan was giving us a, a week of, of keynotes on various topics like, like time use, some lectures on, on labor demand, also some lectures on how to write papers and how to manage the editors. I've managed to publish this paper at the end of the day, so it kind of worked. So it's a honor for me to share the stage 10 years later. As much as I like to repeat Michal's <laughs> thing, I got to use my own slides. Okay, now I got to get my own stuff up here. No. Should I close this? Let's minimize this. Watch this. And hold on. Call this up. Voila. And control L. And let's try clicking. No, that didn't work. No. Anyway, that's the title page. Uh, there we go. What, what did you do? 
Okay, the bottom. There we go. Okie doke. Uh, this is, oops, I'll try to be good on this. Uh, I was asked by Gary to give this talk. He actually looked over a lot of the slides before I finished it up. So you can blame him for approving this. Before I start, on behalf of IZA, I want to thank you all for being here. A delight for the IZA to be co-hosting this conference. Uh, I want to make you feel good, those who are participants, by letting you know that we had three times as many submissions of papers as we accepted. So the fact that you're here uh, really speaks to the quality of what you submitted, and we're very grateful we got that many. Also want to thank Julia Granata for having organized this so very, very well, and Malu Poveda for having kept us in line and indeed babysat, I think, for me and so many other people. Uh, before I start, I want to ask you, how many of you have PhDs in economics or are currently studying for a PhD in economics? Raise your hand. Okay, it's the overwhelming majority. Good, okay? Because this is aimed at development economists who have PhD in economics, which is most of you. Uh, my hope is to get you thinking about what you do and perhaps to annoy you also, since annoyance is the beginning of wisdom. Let me stress first that I am not a development economist. I was thinking, had I ever done anything in development? And I said, yeah, I realized I got involved in the paper on the effects of the demographic dividend in Brazil uh, with a couple of sociologists at Texas. And we did publish that in an utterly obscure journal, which I'm sure nobody here has ever read. So I have done one piece in development, but I admit nearly complete ignorance. And so what this talk is about is really it's somewhat a bibliometric lecture, but it's also a history of thought methodology lecture, and that's what I got to get across. Part of it was done for another project which we published last year, and then this has been extended to thinking about development and what goes on in development methodology today, at least in the academic journals that I read. Uh, so the first question I want to ask, a general question, is has the nature of empirical work in microeconomics Notice I'm limiting it to empirical stuff in micro. Has it changed? Why? And how does micro work in development economic, again, scholarly work published in journals changed? And how is that different from what goes on in applied micro generally? Next question is, has the importance of theory in empirical microeconomics changed? And again, why? Uh, my expertise on this is simply because I'm old. I mean, I've been trying to publish since 1965. Uh, Piotr introduced me and mentioned these lifetime awards. I got two of these awards in 2013. My older son, who actually is less of a wise guy than the younger son, said, Dad, the fact you're getting lifetime awards now might tell you something, uh, which is an interesting point. But if you have children, you know that's the way they behave. Uh, so I've published, as Piotr said, about 100 refereed papers despite 230 plus tries. This is a very difficult business and it's increasingly difficult. I'm very glad I'm old when it was easier in the past. Uh, Trying to think about what's going on in methodology and applied economics and I think the biggest change has been the emphasis on the creation of your own data sets. In other words, creating data from scratch, okay, or getting stuff by trolling the internet and creating a new data set. I want to show you the evidence on this uh, where I've looked at applied micro articles in the so-called top three journals. Uh, that's the AER, Journal of Political Economy, and Quarterly Journal of Economics. And I've taken one year from each of six decades. This is a table published in the JEL a few years back. Oh, why isn't this going now? Ugh. Okay. Well, we are impacted, as it were. Well, this may be a negative illustration of the complementarity of technology and human capital, my having very little capital. Okay, this one's going to work now? Good. There we go. Okay. The problem is I don't believe in the JEL categories because, in fact, at these days, methodology has become more important than the specific topic. So what I've done is gone through all the articles in this sample, sample I created, and tried to classify them into five categories. Theory, theory with simulation, that's a lot of the macro calibration that's been going on, although finally, thank God, it's diminishing. Empirical, canned data. 
So I've published a lot of papers on the NLSY, CPS, PSID, and many of you have also. I call that canned data. It's there for you. Next, empirical own data. Okay. Uh, the stuff I was talking about, creating your own data set either from the web or going out and gathering things somehow. And lastly, experiments, usually not natural. Okay, I would call them unnatural, but that's a term of opprobrium, okay? These are not JEL categories, okay? The big change, as you can see from the following table, and I think, does this have a pointer or not? It doesn't have a pointer. As you can see from the table, the big change has been the tremendous decrease in the importance of theory articles in the major journals that most people in the profession look at with regular basis. That's been a tremendous drop in that, and the big rise has been the publication of articles over the years in which people have collected their own data and based the paper on that. Okay? These are the two big changes in what's published in the journals that are most widely read in our field. Okay? And what's interesting is on the methodology and how it's changed, even with applied econometrics or applied economics, there's a low, for those of you who may remember this, or read History of Thought, there's an old article by Chaling Koopmans called Measurement Without Theory, published I think in the middle 40s or late 40s, where he derided the NBER approach, which he called this measurement without theory. And the question, I think Koopmans was not just hitting at the NBER, but also at all of empirical economics, okay? And the question is, was this correct? How did it change? And has it changed again? So let's look at that. What we call the first revolution, it's a revolution that took place when I was in the middle of grad, starting graduate school in 65, what I would call the theory-based empirical work. Those who went through graduate school and did applied work, which I did in the 60s, were taught that you must have something theoretical underlying what you're doing and actually link the empirical work to the theory. Okay? And to me, this was sort of a golden age. I mean, I took labor econs, I think, as an undergraduate right at the time Becker published Human Capital, and we thought this was the greatest thing going, and it really inspired a lot of people. Uh, the question is, does this really happen, or is this just sort of a myth in people, old people's minds about what was going on? Is it a, just a nostalgia for a past that didn't exist? Let me give you some what I think are archetypal papers in Applied Micro, okay? George Borjas's AER86 paper, which anybody who has read anything in Migration and Econs had jolly well better have read, and what he made the simple point was that the second moment of the income distribution matters for people's choices about where they wanna move to. And my guess is if you've done any labor, you know this paper. This other paper you probably don't know, but I'm rather proud of it. Uh, we wrote down a utility maximizing model of when you cut off the endpoint of your lifetime utility function and used it to predict the effects of various observables on the incidence of suicide. More generally, uh, the Becker Mincer Investment in Human Capital stuff, which people are familiar with, one of the prettiest papers, which is moderately widely known in this area, is also by Jacob Mincer on tide migration how couples will move together and how the movement, and this is actually, it's increasingly important in light of the rising number and incidence of professional couples, how one might be a tide mover or a tide stayer. It's a JPE 1978, a truly beautiful piece of work with some theory and then some very, very simple and utterly convincing testing of it. Uh, if you don't know the paper, I heartily recommend it. The second revolution I call it exogeneity uber alles, which is the near abandonment of theory in applied micro stuff. It's a search for shocks, natural experiments, okay, where something just occurs because of a shock like Hurricane Katrina, unnatural experiments, some legislation occurs that causes an effect, demographic variation, and RCTs, which I will get back to. Some of the archetypal papers on this are Josh Angra's paper on the Vietnam lottery, which had some basis in theory. His purpose was to use a randomization to look at the effect of, educa of education on income and thus on the returns to education. 
Uh, Doug Allman's paper, which had no basis in economics whatsoever, it's pure demography, was looking at the effect of the Spanish flu in 1918 on long-term adult outcomes. And I'll come back to discussing this stuff when I illustrate, uh, am I right in thinking about how important it is? And then David Jagerman and Danny Pazerman's paper, which is really a Granger causality test of whether the Israelis or the Palestinians are causing the fighting that goes on there repeatedly. Again, there's no economics in that whatsoever. Uh, I can list these paper ad nauseum, but one of my co-authors actually, and not a teacher, but a colleague temporarily, Zvi Grilich has said, the plural of anecdote is data. And uh, what I want to do is look at, in fact, do the data support this kind of thinking about was there really a first revolution and a second revolution? We need to mechanism to classify articles. So what we've done is gone through the top five journals, AER, QJE, JPE, uh, Econometrica, and then the Review of Economic Studies, which in fact is not a top five journal, though we think it is. It's much less cited than the other one. And tried to classify papers in applied micro in these journals according to a uniform criterion. So what we did is each of us, I and my co-author on older papers, read every one of these darn things, made a classification up, because it's obviously subjective, and I tried to ask the question, do we agree? And we agreed pretty well. The classification is as follows, zero, which I guess is somewhat a negative way of putting things, pure policy evaluation, no link to theory, no pretense to link to economic theory whatsoever. Uh, no theory in the paper, but might be based on theory, like Angus rate of return to education or gender wage stuff. That might be based on theory. Number two, cites the theoretical model created by somebody else. Number three, actually writes down some theory of his or her own, elaborates upon it, and then tries to test it. And four, writes down a serious mathematical model in which there's an underlying estimable relationship and tries to estimate it. The table of the results. So we did this classification here. We did it for 51 to 55 before the first revolution, 73, 77, and we could have gone with more years, but this is a lot of work, and we got a good sized sample, 100 for the first period, 200 for the second, and 200 for the third period, 07, 08, which is in fact post what I call the second revolution. And the crucial comparison is looking at greater than or equal to two, in other words, some theory in the paper. And as you can see from the table up there, in the first period, less than half of the papers had any pretense of being tied to any economic theory. In the second period after the revolution, the first revolution, uh, about 80% did. I mean, the typical paper in the top journals in those days had a theory in there, either explicitly spelled out or linked to some theory spelled out elsewhere and showing how the empirical work was tied to that theory. In 0708, we're down below two thirds of the papers in these top journals being linked to theory. And just to make sure that this wasn't an outlier and that things have not maybe changed, I did the same thing for micro articles in 2015. There are many more applied micro articles. And the fraction with some theory is almost identical to what it was in 07, 08. So it's very clear that our notion of this revolution, both revolutions, really did happen. There was a big rise in the use of economic theory in applied micro, and there's been a substantial drop off since that period, but not quite going back to the pre-revolutionary pre times. This is really remarkable to me. I remember sitting as an assistant professor at Princeton, and I and Ashenfelter, who was a colleague of mine, listened to two old guys, they didn't know we heard them, complaining, and one guy said to the other, is this mathematical stuff in economics ever going to end? And, you know, the answer is, yeah, it sort of has ended, darn it. These guys, I mean, they're long since dead, would be quite happy about what's happened. It has, to some extent, ended, which I find absolutely remarkable that this change has occurred. What about development? And what we did here, what I did, and this is just me, is take the top five journals, the same five journals, which people use top five, which is, I always put it in quotes because they ain't, 
I guess they are, but the articles aren't necessarily. There's tremendous heterogeneity. Uh, take the most two recent years in JSTOR, between 2010 and 2015. I didn't use the very most recent years because that would have required digging through every single volume by, by hand. And find all the articles that you think or that I thought might be classified as development economics. And try to classify them the same way I classified these over here. Okay? And so the list of the five most Google Scholar cited papers in this year are the following. A paper by Baird, I don't know who he is, called Cash or Condition. And some of you probably know, I hope people know these papers. Yeah? Okay, I sure don't. I mean, this is not my field. The next one is by Nathan Nunn called Potatoes Contribution. I've never read it. Uh, the next one you might classify as economic history, but since it goes back far uh, back enough, I'd say it's developed. It's by Hans Joachim Vogt on persecution and the continuation by area of Germany in anti Semitism. Then there's uh, Jensen. I can't remember his first name, on labor market opportunities, and finally, uh, I think it's Pascaline Dupas on short-run subsidies. Okay? If you notice in the right-hand column there the classification of these, only one of these would, be quali be, uh, would I count as having had any basis in economic theory whatsoever. That's the Dupas paper in Econometrica. I list these as examples since you're familiar with them and also because they are the five most cited out of the 47 papers that I classified as being applied micro in development. This doesn't mean there aren't development papers. Okay? I mean, going back a ways, certainly Gary Field's own stuff is development. That's why he got the Lysier Labor Prize, but it's not applied micro. There's no empirical work in some of his stuff. Okay, what about the 1970s? In other words, go back to the period before the second, but after the first revolution. Take three years, I had to do three years because there wasn't as much published then, and the same five journals, and look not at Google Scholar because Google Scholar only came up more recently, and old articles are under, un, the citations to old articles are probably undercounted there. I found 22 papers that I would call applied micro and development in those three years. And I counted web of science citations. Uh, web of science, people familiar with this? Okay, well the web of science has problems because first of all, unless a paper is published, the citations in it to other papers aren't counted. So it's sort of slow, but for going back to the 1970s, 40 years, doesn't matter at all. The most cited paper in development was Mark Rosenzweig's piece in Econometrica. Then Rolfo, whose name I don't know at all, uh, another paper. People may know this if you're old enough. Nobody reads papers published before they're in graduate school. What the heck? But let's assume some of you might know this. Uh, John Fay's paper on growth in the family. Dixon, which is basically a redo of V. Grillica's hybrid corn thesis paper. And lastly, Larry Lau's paper, looking at some developing country with some fancy production function. If you notice, all but one of these, the Dixon paper, had some theoretical economic basis. In other words, just as in applied micro generally, in the 70s, there were, we were using economics. Well, you were, I wasn't. You were using economics in development papers that were applied, and in the teens, People were doing it to a much lesser extent. These are the most well-known papers. Let's look at a table illustrating it. So here we have the exact same thing that we had done for applied micro generally, looking at the fraction of papers that had some underlying theoretical basis. It was 77% in development in the late 70s. If you remember back to the table before, it was 82% in applied micro generally. Not much difference, right? And in these statistically, I mean, it's, oh, it's rather stupid to be doing statistical tests on a population like this, but statistically there was no difference. In the mid-2010s, it's below a half. And it was 62%, if you remember from the previous table in applied micro generally, and those are significantly less in development than in other stuff. In other words, the trends here are the same, there's a growth and then a drop. It happens the drop is even bigger in applied development than it is in applied micro generally. Okay. Next question I want to ask is, 
okay, well, we have this change in development, also in applied microgenomy, but I want to concentrate on development. And I want to measure impact and ask the question, do these two different kinds of papers have different scholarly impacts, okay? Now, look, I, look, in this audience, I am fully cognizant of the fact that there's a hell of a lot more going on than scholarly impact, okay? I recognize that, but the people doing these things to a very large extent want to have a scholarly impact, and if they do so, others will have a scholarly impact, and it might have some impact in the real world, which Michal talked about so very, very well. So what I want to do is on all the papers that I talked about in the sample I created, I want to measure their impact Google Scholar citations, that's the best measure I can do, far better than saying, hey, my paper is important, nobody cites it, but it's really fundamentally important, which I hear that term all the time in department meetings, and it drives me nuts, and I've learned to shut my mouth about this kind of rubbish, but I'm right and they're wrong, okay? <laughs> no, I mean, I am, there's no question about it, okay? So let's measure this by Google Scholar citations, and just run over a few regressions asking which type of paper in development gets more citations. So here's a table, I hope it's visible. Uh, this is the 47 papers I mentioned. They're the means, if you remember the economic content was 47%. Uh, these were citations as of March 2018 when I prepared this. 40% uh, of the papers were in the AAR, 23% in the QJE. Those are the major outlets for applied micro and development among the top five journals. I'm not looking at the specialized journals, even the top ones like the Journal of Development Economics, okay? That's a lot of work, enough's enough, 47's a reasonable sample, okay? Just look at the first, second column, ask a simple question, does having more economic content lead to more citations? No, quite the contrary. Having more economic content means the paper has less of a scholarly impact, which says something about your field. Now maybe it's papers of, I mean, it's not my field, I and mean, that's the beauty of being an outsider. I can yell at you, and you can say this guy doesn't know what the hell he's talking about, okay? Which is fine by me. Maybe it's the fact that some journals where things are published get more cited, so put in fixed effects for the two major journals, and the left out category is the ReStuds, Econometrica, and JPE, okay? And you know, that matters somewhat, but it's still the case that the articles that use no economic theory whatsoever have a larger impact. Uh, T is greater than one, which for a labor economist is good enough, has a larger impact than articles that have some economic theory. So this is remarkable to me, and I found it sort of surprising, okay? A theoretical articles are significantly more cited than other articles. That's a bottom line on this little bit of empirical work. The question is, why are they cited more? Okay. I was trying to think about this, and I can't do any empirical testing on it, or testing, all testing's empirical, I would say. Uh, and why has this been happening? Uh, I think the mainstream is not to use economics. That is the mainstream, and people who want to get ahead in scholarly life or any other life want to go with the mainstream. A wonderful line by an old friend of mine made a comment at an NBER meeting many years ago saying these people are like bees. One person finds a very rich field of flowers and starts sucking the honey and all the other bees then fly to the field of flowers and lick it clean, okay? And I think that's not so different from this here. Next reason why this might be is Economics is old hat. Okay? In other words, all the fancy stuff we get, and you all still get in your theory classes, if your PhD is newer than mine, which it is, is old. In other words, we've worked through it already. It has nothing else to tell it. My explanation, which is really nasty, is that it's a heck of a lot easier to find your exogenous variable, run your experiment, than trying to think about the model underlying what you're trying to observe. This is a nasty comment. Okay. But I really think that's part of what's going on. So let me not finish, but talk a bit about what I call as a rant on the second revolution. This is my rant on the partial abandonment of theory. First of all, and I listen to these papers all the time. The papers I've heard to, in this conference, by the way, 
have not suffered from this problem. The one I hear, ones I hear at Texas, which has a large and growing development group, are ones if they heard me, they would probably th throw me out of the building, okay? First of all, the term identification strategy. This drives me nuts. I mean, we all studied game theory, didn't we? Well, I, I mean, I read von Neumann Morgenstern many years ago. Strategy is me against another player. Who am I playing against when I'm writing my paper? Okay, so this, this is a silly comment. Other economists, the data, the data is not active. The data does, does, do not have a strategy, I guarantee that. Next thing is evidence from. It has become de rigueur in empirical work to have a title, colon, evidence from. Have you noticed that? Okay, this is a mindless mantra. 37% uh, of the papers on the program here have colon evidence from. I counted, okay? And at a general labor conference, huge conference I organize next month to celebrate the IZA's 20th anniversary, a fully one quarter. Now I admit, I've done this twice. In 2000, we published a paper in the RE Stats called Something Something Evidence from California. So I'm guilty, but I was ahead of the time. There were very few then. And last year in the AEA Papers and Proceedings, I published a paper called Replication in Economics, Evidence from Data. Okay, which you can see what the purpose of that was, okay? I mean, I'm serious. This is a sign of non-originality, damn it. Okay. Next, robustness checks. If you look at papers today, and Glenn Ellison had a paper on this in 03, and it's yet gotten worse. If you look at papers today, the length of papers has been going up and up and up in the top journals. I published a paper in the QJ in 70. It was a, the journal, which had a very famous paper called The Market for Lemons in it, much more famous than my own paper, was about this thick. You pick up an issue of the QJ today, I have trouble lifting it. It's not just that my muscles are getting more flaccid over time either, okay? The, the papers are 60 pages long because the editors insist and all the referees who, who want to be your co-authors insist on including every darn robustness check you can think of. Why don't we put them in footnotes or in an online appendix? Nobody wants to read this rubbish. Placebo tests. I mean, this is part of our fake experimentalization. And most of these are really sugar water at best, okay? Oh, this is now dying again. Yep, it died. Ah, I want you to ask yourself the question. When you write a paper, could a sociologist, which is, I mean, it's a, it's, which I view as a term of opprobrium, uh, who was well trained in stata or a demographer, and I, some of my best friends are demographers and sociologists, could they have written this paper also? In other words, you spent all this time trying to learn economic theory. You got tested on it. If you hadn't done well, you'd have not gotten your PhD in economics. Could somebody who never had any of that theoretical stuff have written this paper just as well as you? Again, I think we probably are better at using stated than other people are, but they can do it. Sociologists do exactly the same thing. What do we have to offer? If we're going in this direction, why do we force PhD students to learn this stuff? I mean, it's not like a merit badge in Boy Scouting, which you're never gonna use again, but we aren't using again, okay? So I think we ought to think about this. We do have something, I really firmly believe, we have something unique to offer. The theory that we learn and that we teach does tell us something, is testable, should consider, condition our thinking. Next, the term RCT drives me nuts. I call them really cute trials, okay? Oh, yeah, I know, okay? <laughs> do we worry more about cuteness than about using economics to give new ideas that only we can do. I just finished reading a book by an economist named Andrew Lee. Anybody know the name? Probably you know him. He's an Australian labor economist, PhD from the Kennedy School. He's also a front bencher in the opposition in the Australian parliament, okay? He's just a really smart boy. He's publishing a book this summer called Randomistas, okay, which, uh, the title of which is a term of opprobrium that Angus Deaton applied to this kind of work. You may have seen it. And uh, I sent Angus these slides. He loved it, not surprisingly. Uh, 
it turns out that, I mean, what people are doing on this stuff, as you should know, and probably do know, has been done for many years in various other areas in very similar ways. I'm not deriding the usefulness of it, but that's a lot more to economics and what we as economists can do than what goes on here. And I wonder, when in the early 70s, I got involved with an organization called Manpower Demonstration Research Corporation. Anybody ever heard of this? If you have, I'd be amazed. I mean, it still exists. And they said they were doing experimental stuff, but to me, demonstration meant they could spend money. There wasn't any real evaluation. There was no underlying economics. No testing of predictions from principles or even new ideas. And this bothers me. Again, my plea is that we do have something useful to offer here, and we darn well ought to do it. If not, I see very little reason for studying economics. Sociology is a lot easier. You can do that and learn Stata and run your regressions very happily. This, again, this thing is not working well. There we go. Conclusion. Is this a fad, this sort of second revolution, or is it permanent? I don't know. I mean, I like to think people will realize that and start doing more economics. But I think the theoretical predictions of economics that we get from optimizing behavior by thinking how agents interact in markets can tell us something at the micro level. This says nothing about macro, which I know nothing about, although I've taught it for many years. But I mean, no, but look, that doesn't distinguish me from anybody else teaching macro, believe me. So look, my bottom line here is let's use the stuff that we have a comparative and an absolute advantage in. We know economics. We spend time studying it. It is useful. And the bottom line here is it's time to put the econ back into economics. Thank you very much. OK, Piotr, you're in charge. Thank you, Dan. We've been entertained and we've been challenged. So now we can entertain and challenge Dan. Questions? I'm really nice when I get questions. I don't fight. <laughs> <laughs> so what I infer is that people realize I'm right but may not be doing what I say and are hiding their heads in shame? No. We already have one, but where is the mic? Professor Hammermesh, thank you very much for uh, such a nice presentation. As always, I've been to so many of your presentations that always was amazed. Uh, so uh, you had a very nice term called Uber, uh, endogeneity Uber Alice. Do you think that would be de the deriving force for uh, these movements towards, towards uh, RCTs, towards you know, finding causality? Like now we are really obsessed with finding causality. And to find causality, you don't really need much of a theory. You really need good empirical strategy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in other words, uh, I think you do need a theory. I mean, again, without the theory, anybody could do this, okay? But I think by thinking about the theory that, that leads to cause, I'm not a structural person because I, the restrictions there are so, so strain, stringent that it loses what we learn. But I think by thinking about what we're looking for causality in, I mean, I did this stuff on labor demand 25 years ago, and I saw one very nice paper yesterday which is sort of structural, but trying to think about causality, yes, but also trying to think about the parameters underlying the behavior that generates the causal inferences. And that's what I think we ought to be doing. So yes, I think causality is fine, but without theory, again, we have nothing special to offer. And I think by doing the theory, we can learn something general about the parameters that underlie the behavior in the very, very specific example that we're looking at, and then apply them elsewhere. Otherwise, I don't see why looking at the effect of giving people bathtubs in Kenya, whatever the hell else they do, is going to be generalizable anywhere. 
But if I know about what the behavioral parameters are that lead people who use the bathtubs to bathe more are, that's a silly example, I realize, then we might have something generalizable. Otherwise, these are just basically going back to the 1950s case studies that people did in labor in those days. Um, I, I, yeah, um, so, so uh, well, thank you for, uh, for, for your talk. Um, I'm, I think I'm guilty of every single thing that, that you mentioned, but, but thank you. Um, <laughs> um, you, you, you point out that, uh, you know, uh, economists, uh, maybe not as much as in the past, but they have been moving towards uh, less theory, right? Um, even th I mean, I, even though I agree that theory is, uh, is of course really important, and I like the economic paradigm, I think some people might argue that moving away from constrained optimization as the model for people is actually what could be the, the right direction in economics, right? The, the behavioral crowd. So I, I'm sure you have thoughts on that. Could you share them? Uh, it's especially difficult to answer you at this time, given that Dick Thaler got a Nobel Prize for this stuff last year, right? Okay. Look, I think the behavioral stuff is fine, but in the end, it's really a modification at the edges. I mean, it's not central. It doesn't destroy the paradigm of constrained optimization. And I think if people want to build some formal models of behavioral stuff, modifying constrained optimization models, and use that to infer with the appropriate nods to causality what's going on both in developed and developing countries, fine. Okay? But again, that's an imposition on the behavioral people, not simply to say, oh, constrained optimization is wrong, but rather, here is the way at the edges it's wrong, just as Einsteinian physics modified Newtonian physics, which is basically correct, but is, an, uh, is a modification at really the edges. Okay? I think there's an analogy there is exactly correct in this case. So, um, oh yeah. uh, hi, Dan. Uh, I share some skepticism of the randomistas, but I think there's an economic explanation, too, for why RCTs have become so prevalent at the moment. And it's much cheaper to do this. You can actually afford to do it in many developing countries, and it's be much more expensive to do it in other places. So it's become a very popular tool, especially in development. And I think randomized control trials are really cute trials. Actually, explains why, explains explains why uh, development is more, you know, is, uh, ha has a stronger version of this trend. Because with a randomized control trial, it lends itself to just X causes Y. It doesn't have to, I, I, I know. My question for you is, what about labor? I mean, you, had, you did the analysis for all the applied fields. You showed results for doing What about the other applied fields? Okay, I didn't separate labor out from all these other ones, okay? Problem, this is very disturbing to me. I'm not sure this is very disturbing and embarrassing. I'm not sure what labor is today. Is it health? Education? I mean, at the labor seminar, I used to call it labor seminar in Texas, all they have is education papers. Somebody looking for, uh, I don't know, uh, well, like a student of mine looking at the effect of school starting times on uh, test scores. Is that labor? Mm, is there any economic theory? No. Okay, and this is a PhD student of mine, so I, I, I take the blame for that too. Uh, no, I think the same thing would be true, especially because so much of the top journal publications in applied micro is what I would call labor broadly defined, health, education, and so on and so forth. So I'm quite sure labor looks the same way as the applied micro, because it is a large part of applied micro. So we're just as guilty. And I admit I've published a couple of papers like this, but it's gotten to the point here I am the oldest person in the room by at least 10 years, and yet there's more theoretical basis to the rubbish I publish than to other people's stuff. This is very disturbing to me. I mean, we've abandoned the, the, the theory. And I think it's easy to abandon theory because it's darn hard to do theory. Now, your economic story about why there is more of this in development is a really cute one. Okay? No, because it's economic. It says, look, it's cheaper to do this kind of thing in a developing economy than it is in a wealthy economy. That's a very good argument, okay? Uh, if, you know, if I were to run a regression to explain the difference in the two groups, there you go. If I modify this and try to publish it, 
you will get a thank, because that's a great story. My turn. Thank you so much. I loved every minute of your talk, and I've taken pictures without your permission that I'm going to share with all my That's colleagues. Okay. I don't take royalties. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to talk a little. I'm a development economist, and I actually knew yeah, I quite a bit. I won't blame you. Go ahead. No, no, no. I'm not one of the people that should be hiding. I'm proud to say I don't think I should be hiding my hand, uh, head in shame. Um, in the answer to your question, uh, is this just a fad? I wonder if you've considered. Something that I, I have thought about this, um, and my feeling is, unlike the other revolutions, uh, this one might be longer to change or to get to the next phase or whatever you want to call it. And here's my explanation for this. Um, I think there's a political economy of publication yeah. in development economics. And in every subspecialty. In every economics, subspecialty, I'm sure, but especially with R RCTs. Because contrary to what Albert is saying, where it's cheaper, to, of course it is cheaper to do it in developing countries than in developed, but it is still expensive compared to using the NLSY or the PSID. And so there's this, it's easier to do this when you have a lot of money. It's harder to get a lot of money if you didn't already have an advisor who had a lot of money of their own. And so, I think it's going to take a while for this to phase out, perhaps, compared to the other revolutions. The other question I have for you, a testable prediction. Um, have you looked at the concentration of um, the publications? The concentration by school or institution where the people are located? Yes. This can lead me into an awful lot of difficulties, okay? <laughs> I have not. And one can make up anecdotes about this. And I've certainly seen papers, indeed papers in the 60s, and a very recent paper unpublished by a German economist on own school bias in publication. And it goes beyond that, its own network bias, okay? But whether it's different in development than anything else? That I just don't know. I mean, look, we like openness. You were telling me all about all your openness work last, transparency work. I'd like to think things have gotten less old boyish over time, which is what you're talking about. But I have no evidence on that at all. I mean, it is the case in the top journals now. I mean, it used to be when I was starting off in this business and through the 70s and early 80s that the overwhelming number of publications were by people in North America and Northern Europe in the top journals. This is no longer true. You just look at the journals and these are worldwide and no matter, if you're an academic, no matter what university you're at, the way you get ahead, the biggest feather in your cap is publishing in this most selective set of journals. You all know this. In that sense, one would hope things have, have become more open. And certainly in terms of the world, the, the increasing breadth of economic thinking worldwide, that's true. But whether in fact different schools, different people have their stuff and they get it all taken care of, and everyone here thinks that his work is discriminated against when it's turned down by journals, right? And that if you were only at Harvard, they'd be publishing your stuff uh, without a problem. I don't think that's the way the world works at all. So I like to think it's gotten more open, but I have no serious evidence on that. I'm sorry. And whether development's gotten more open, I don't know either. So to answer your question, pure ignorance. <laughs> That's a great question, and maybe that could be my next. I call these my gossip papers. And okay, this could be my next gossip paper. It'd be pretty cool to do that. We have a couple. Yeah, we have a couple of more minutes, and I'm pretty sure we'll have a couple of more questions. Yes, I'm just curious uh, of what you think about new generations, like entering as students, in the um, and how this uh, learning process is going to be different for a future PhD in economics with access to data from like the internet and all of these new uh, own data sources. What are your thoughts on well, that? There, there are two issues here. The one I stressed in the talk was, 
look, at, you look at the instruction in PhD programs today, uh, the theory has gotten increasingly abstruse. I mean, the theory I learned in 1965, the micro theory, was out of a book called Henderson and Quant, which probably nobody's, anybody ever heard of the book? Okay. This was just constrained optimization, micro, and various consumption production. I even taught economic theory, graduate students, which is a truly scary thought for a quarter, several quarters at Michigan State, doing production, theory of production, okay? But the stuff people do right now in graduate theory courses is much fancier than that. I couldn't get into grad school today having had two years of college math, okay? I, nobody would have me. And yet, what are they using it for? other than to show they can do it. And at some point, people are going to realize that we're just wasting people's times. I mean, get a PhD at the Kennedy School and don't take all the fancy theory courses at Harvard because you're not going to be using them. So I think the program, the graduate education will change. On the other hand, there's no doubt that econometrics in grad schools has gotten much, much better. I mean, I, used to, I taught a class in the late 80s, which I called Very Applied Econometrics, trying to get the students to actually do something rather than just learn econometric theory. Today, people really do that. And this actually ties a little bit to your point. It's because the cost of doing stuff yourself has gone down. Everybody's got a computer with huge amounts of memory and can do all kinds of neat things, get stuff off the web, and create these wonderful data sets. So in that sense, things are better. It's this integration of the two which I see not happening, and I wish it would. So that's where I see things going. But again, I'm not going to be around till the end of this revolution, I'm afraid. Because as you said, it's going to take a while for a variety of reasons. So I will have one. Uh oh. All right. <laughs> yeah, kind of returning to the, you know, going back 10 years, you were, you were, uh, uh, at the summer school that I attended, you had the lecture, you know, how, pe how to publish and uh, how people should structure papers and what to do with it and so on and so on. Great. So are you giving this kind of lectures t these days as well? And what would you change now in comparison to how, would you, were doing this how you were doing these lectures 10 years ago? Okay. Not this lecture, but he's talking about a lecture I gave over the years and I still give with changes on how to publish in a good journal. It's called How to Publish in a Good Journal, dash, dash, not evidence from. I wish I knew, okay? I mean, I think the most important thing to realize, I used to, when I started off in this business, I had a rule, alluding to baseball, three strikes and you're out. If my paper got turned down three times, I would assume it's not publishable anywhere, okay? Today, I don't know, 10 strikes and you're out? I mean, the most important thing for young people in the business is to recognize, I don't know if you ever had when you were a child, they used to have about one meter high inflatable clowns with a bean bag on the bottom and you'd knock it and it popped back up. You have to be that to be successful in this business because you get knocked down much more than I got knocked down when I was starting out. And if you get discouraged, uh, you won't get ahead either in academe or in government or, and non-government related institutions. So that's how I would change it most of all. Just the need for persistence and stick to itiveness given that acceptance rates at the so-called CHOP journals are 5% now. That's the biggest change I would make in that. And uh, it's only going to get worse or more difficult because more and more people worldwide are trying to do the same thing as you or I. Or as you, not as me. Do we have any more questions? Okay, yes. <laughs> and I'm not approaching you to pull a Donald Trump on Hillary Clinton, if you remember that debate. It's rather I have trouble hearing, okay? I'm not trying to intimidate you by coming closer. Oh, it's okay. So Whereas, I was wondering... Of course, Donald wasn't trying to... Sorry, I don't want... <laughs> no, I will not start on him, okay? Go ahead. Okay. Since you mentioned the paper about lemons that you usually read and it's quite easy to read and in the, you see the mathematics and they are like, the, or even my students at the undergrad level can understand it. And now you go to these theoretical models nowadays which you need much more mathematics and maybe that could be discouraging some of our 
students in economics into going that way. I don't know if you have anything okay. feelings about like uh, to go into the to the simple and to to really address great questions. That's my feeling. Like people nowadays, they do also theoretical models, but now they are also doing theoretical models of, of useless theoretical useless, models. Is what yes. you're saying? <laughs> well, that's a, are they really useless? I mean, think about. We didn't have game theory in grad school when I was a student, okay? It sort of came in in the early 80s. Is that useless? It's fairly fancy. Or have we just not tried to use it in an empirical way by thinking about how agents interact? Now, they have an I.O., but I don't think it's any different in labor markets, really. And I think of the fancy theory of Al Roth's unmatching, which is one of the great ideas of the last 50 years. That's extremely useful empirically. And I've seen remarkably little other than applying it in the context of educational matching in New York, a la Roland Fryer and company. Uh, these are vastly useful ideas, but it's hard to get into them for most people. But in fact, students are being taught this stuff in the theory classes. They just aren't applying it when it gets to doing applied work and applied micro. That's what's, I think, bothersome to me more than anything else. But I don't think it's off-putting because the grad students who are taking this stuff get it shoved down their throats. Yeah, I think we should wrap it up here. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for a wonderful lecture and for a great session of questions. <laughs> and also just let, let me just add that we still have a couple of coffee breaks and lunches to inspire Dan to get into development economics because you haven't really achieved much in this field. So, you know, there's a green pasture. There's a green pasture for you. Thank you. Well, please wait a minute. Uh, as yesterday, we will meet at 1 p.m. on the fifth floor for our lunch. But for now, I will invite you here to the stage to take a picture, please. Uh, remember to take all your personal stuff with you. Oh, and at the end of the day, we'll meet again at the fifth floor for the closing cocktail. <laughs>